Okay, welcome back. This is Christian Bible Chapel. Welcome back, and we thank you. This is our worship part of our service, and you can get your hymn books out and turn to page 334. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Page 334. Praise God. We're in Ephesians chapter 5 after the song and prayer. We're just going to do one stanza, page 334, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. The first stanza. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit. Washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. One more, number two. Perfect salvation. Divine. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending, great from above. Echoes of mercies, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. This is my story. This is my song. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you once again as you come on this Lord's Day, giving you all glory, giving you all honor, and we thank you. Bless us now as we go into the blessed word of God, as we, as Christians, people of God, that we may be cleansed, be strengthened in the word of God. Those that are not saved may hear the truth, repent of their sins, and trust Jesus Christ as Savior before it's too late. We're still in the book of Ephesians. We're almost finished here. We've got one more chapter to go. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to look at verse, we're going to read verse 1 and up to verse uh, 13. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish uh, talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this we know that no harmonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an adulterer has an inheritance in the kingdom of God and of, of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is even, it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest in the light, for whatsoever does make manifest is light. Well, walking a righteous life is through the power of the Holy Spirit is. It's, it's, it's a life and an accomplishment that we totally need to trust Jesus in our daily living. On our own strength, we cannot do this. Philippians chapter 2 says, 
we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. So we pray, God, that he will strengthen us to live what? Holy and righteous, to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Paul says, as believers in Christ, we need to be followers of God. In other words, to imitate him. To imitate him in our Christian living. The word Christian means Christ-like. Your life is walking in the same pattern as Christ was. Christ, Jesus, is without sin. He knew no sin. But because we are in this body, we are capable of sinning and making mistakes or falling. But that does not keep us from walking holy. That does not keep us from walking righteous or in truth. Paul says that as dear children, we walk in love as Christ also loved us as the people of God. He loved us, Ephesians chapter 5, later on is going to tell us that he gave himself for us. He has given himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Can you imagine that? The death of Jesus Christ in the nostril of the Father was a sweet aroma. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. It was needed. It was harsh. It was very harsh for Christ to endure the cross, despising the shame. But yet he endured it. He went through it for the elect, for those whom he loved, as stated in verse 1. And therefore, since we know this, we walk in love, as Christ walked in love. He had loved us. And he gave himself as a sacrifice. So the Christian life is a life of sacrifice. It's a life of giving up what you really want in order to please Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior. Paul says, since we have came out of that old life, notice what he says in verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness. Now let's look at that. Fornication. Fornication during the days of the ancient days of Rome, as far as the Greeks and going back, was a lifestyle of illicit sex, having pleasure with other females or males. And you enjoy that, that the scripture tells us that it calls it fornication. The word itself in the Greek is pharmakia, which in English is pharmacy, but it lures to the word fornication because back in those days in the ancient time, when you observe the gods and when you're dealing with fornication or sexual activity with another person, it always involved incest, drugs, and alcohol drinking at that time, wine at that time. It was a combination of all those that helped you to experience fornication. You see, when they had parties and what we call parties today and dinners or whatever, it lasts for weeks, for one, two, or even three weeks. It didn't just last a birthday party for a couple of hours. It lasts for weeks. So Paul says, but fornication. Fornication indulges orgies, wild, unpredictable, unrestrained sexual, immoral acts within that compound of both man and woman, woman with man, or both men, men, women with women. But fornication, it carries all that category of bestiality, homosexuality, prostitution, lesbians, and others. It deals with the word fornication. It dealt so that Paul even just and he uses the word all uncleanness, vileness from the body, all uncleanness, or covetousness. Covetousness is wanting something somebody else has and you take it or you, 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 you conceive or you, you, you plot to get it. That's covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as becomes saints. 
The word saint there is set apart. Every, every, every child of God, no matter you've been saved for one hour, one minute, two hours, 20 years, 102 years, you are a saint. You do not become more of a saint. You grow in grace, but not in sainthood. You are a saint. I understand the delusion and error that the Roman Catholic has in order for you uh, to become a saint. But once a person repent of their sins and by faith receive Jesus Christ as Savior, they became a saint. The word itself is separated, set apart, set apart, actually set apart for God, set apart for Jesus Christ. And as you are set apart, you're being cleansed, you've been watched over, you've been cared for by the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. As becometh saints. You know, see, the point that Paul uses that word, becometh, it's, it's not becoming for a person to acknowledge that they are a saint, to live a life of fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness. Now, those are the three realms that Paul is talking about in verse 3. But like I said, under fornication is drunkenness, vile behavior, all right? Excessive, excessive drinking, illicit sex, prostitution, homosexual acts, lesbian, and all sexual sins cover under fornication. Under uncleanness covers all vileness lasciviousness of sins, despicable acts and behavior of uncleanness, and of course, covetousness. These things should not, as Paul said, should be named among you as becoming a saint. Then Paul add to the list, he says, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking. Now, foolish talking and filthiness, are, you know, see, that goes right back to fornication, uncleanness, as in point, and um, uh, court covetousness, because the mouth, the mouth itself, the heart, the heart congests as far as uh, feels it, knows it, and it sends it to the mouth. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and See, see, the scripture says foolish talking. Foolish talking involves unsaved manner of acting and, and jesting and joking and talking and conversation and living. That's what foolish jesting is talking about. Foolish jesting has nothing to do with having a good time, laughing, having a smile on your face or enjoying something that you like to do. So that's the reason why Paul said to the Roman, whatsoever is good, whatsoever is kind, when it's Philippians, whatsoever is good, whatsoever is kind, whatsoever is not. See, not all the time as a Christian, you're going to be in the Bible. Not all the time you're going to be in church. Not all the time you're going to be on your knees praying or even sitting praying. Not all the time you're going to be meditating on the Word of God. You have other responsibilities and all other human acts that you need to take care of and do and participate in. So Paul says, whatsoever is clean, whatsoever is calm, whatsoever is good, whatsoever is think on these things. Because all the time you're not going to think on scriptures. The Bible says, I repeat, neither filthiness nor foolish talking neither uh, jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. See, your time should be giving of thanks to the Lord. For this we know that no whoremonger, I'm going back to fornication again, nor unclean person, nor covetousness, a covetous man. You see how Paul reiterates the same three category as he started off with in verse 3. He co continues it in verse 5. Whoremonger, unclean person, covetous man. 
who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God and of God, of Christ and of God. Then you're not saved. To practice and participate in these things show forth that even though they are not becoming of a saint, it definitely proves by you committing and practicing and staying in it that you're not a child of God. Because Paul says, verse 6, let no man deceive you with vain words. There will come people, as he told the Corinthians and as he told the Ephesians here, as he told the Romans, let no man deceive you. And thinking that because you are indulging in sin and committing sin, that you're still a child of God. Paul told the Romans, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. I'm turning that to Romans chapter 6. But there's something I want to point out there in that passage of scripture. In verse 14 of Romans 6, Paul says, For sin shall not have dominion, com complete control over you. For you are not under the law of sin. See, the law of sin demands that you obey, you do, without question, about sin. Don't worry about it, just do it. If, if it feels good, do it. If you want to do it, do it. Don't worry about it. But Paul says, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law. That law is not the, the, the moral commandments or the Ten Commandments. It's the law of sin. There's a law of sin. There's the law of death. The law of death says if you do anything, if you sin, so you're going to reap the consequences, which is death. Because the wages, the punishment of sin is death. The law of sin, because you're not under the law, but under grace. See, many have taken upon themselves saying, I'm saved, I'm under grace. I can still do what I want, and God is still going to take me to heaven. I'm still a child of God. The Bible does not teach that. Paul says, what shall we say then shall we continue practicing sin shall we continue in sin that grace may abound god forbid in other words in the greek thought it is perish the thought verse 6 verse 15 what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace again paul says in romans 6 15 god forbid look at verse 16 romans 6 16 Know ye not? Are not you aware of this? Paul says, To whom you yield yourselves, slaves to obey, his slaves ye are in whom ye obey. See, there's a difference in the words here. I know in the King English version, it says, uh, version of the Bible, it is servant. But you see, you have to understand that. You have to understand that as a servant, a servant will get paid. A servant is like an employee. You have rights as a servant in the days of the Romans, in the days of the Greeks and going back. You have privileges. But you see, that's why in Romans 6 here, in verse 6, know ye not to whom ye yield yourselves as slaves to obey. You have to obey your master as a slave. See, the translators kept the word master, but they changed the word to servant. It's not wrong with it, but the real meaning to the word is slaves. Let's read it. To know ye not, excuse me, it says, yeah, verse 16, know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves, slaves to obey, servants to obey, his servant his slaves you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, here is the biblical meaning for the word or the phrase sin unto death. Remember 1 John chapter 2 says there is a sin unto death. The sin unto death is when a person is practicing, willfully practicing sin committing sin. And, and, and that's 
you, you're sinning away the day of grace. You're sinning unto death. See here in verse 16. So whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness, you can, each and every one of us, we're, we're of one of those categories. Either we're committing the sin unto death or we are committing righteousness. There it is, obedience unto righteousness. See, some people believe that the sin unto death is a horrible sin that you do that will keep you out of heaven and you won't go to heaven ever again. No, that's not the meaning. That's a traditional denominational meaning for the word. And they, they, they slide the word blasphemy of the Holy Ghost as the sin unto death. That is what Jesus discussed in Matthew 12 has nothing to do with the meaning towards here in our text as well as in 1 John. Chapter 2, there is a sin unto death. The sin unto death is when a person is living a lifestyle of sin, committing sin, practicing sin. And in a sense, they are committing the sin unto death. So either you are committing the sin unto death or as a slave, as a servant to your master, and who's your master? Sin and the devil. So you can only have one master. You can't have two. See, either your, your master is the devil or your master is Jesus Christ. You're serving Satan and sin or Jesus and righteousness. Which one are you choosing? Which one? Which one are you serving right now today? You can't have one feet in one. and No, you can't do both. You, you cannot have two masters. Either you love one and hate the other or hate the other and love the other. You, you cannot have two masters in your life. Now, whether or not you say you're, whether your master is yourself, whether your master is your money, your car, your bank account, your job, your good looks, your career, or whatever, you're serving, you're serving a master. You're committing the sin unto death. And that's going to bring you the punishment, which is the second death. But if you turn around and be converted by means of repenting of your sins, and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will live a life of obedience to righteousness. An unsaved person cannot obey the word of God. Let me repeat that. An unsaved person cannot obey the word of God. The only thing that is recorded in the, see the letters here in the epistles, Romans to Jude or Revelation, is given to the church. Even the letters in Revelations, it's a combined letter. It's a letter within the letters. It's letters within the letter, the book of Revelations, to the church, to the church of Laodicea, to the church of Pergamos, to the church of Ephesus. See? So the epistles is letters to the church, to the Christian. When I say church, I mean the child of God because the letters informs you how to walk obedient and righteous on, as pilgrims on this earth. The letters is not for the unsaved. You don't like, write a letter to your enemy. All right? The only letter you're going to write to your enemy is a truth or say, you know, forgive me. Which is Christ is your enemy if you're not saved. You're an enemy of God. Romans chapter 5. Because you know not God. And therefore, you need the gospel spoke to you. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ, Son of God, the Messiah, came into the world to die for sin, was buried, and rose again, that through faith and repentance in him, you can have eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And that's the message the unsaved need to hear. They don't need to hear, yeah, cleanse yourself. Uh, no jesting and talk. See, all what we just said in, in, in the first part of Ephesians 5, it's totally impossible for the unbeliever to do that because the seed is not in them. The seed of the Holy Spirit is not in them. The love of God is not in them. They are not part of the true church. For you to say, stop fornicating, stop gambling, stop drunkenness, stop lying, stop 
being a homosexual gay, you can't tell people to stop their sins because they can't stop it. So no evangelist or preacher on the corner in the pulpit should be telling people to stop their sinning. They need to tell them to repent of their sins because stopping your sins you can't do because you're unsaved. That's part of your nature to sin. That's what the word means, sinner. One who practices, continues, or does sin. All they need to hear is the gospel. So all that time on the corners, in the fields, in the marketplace, preach the gospel. You don't need to tell them to stop smoking, stop drinking, stop fornicating, stop this. You don't, that's not how you witness. You witness by proclaiming the gospel. You preach by proclaiming the gospel. That's how a person is saved. They are not saved by scripting and stopping. That's an act of works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Stop smoking, stop drinking, lower your dress, cover, cover up your chest as woman, stop taking drugs, stop selling drugs, stop whoremonging. You cannot tell a believer to stop that because they have no will, they have no power. The scripture tells us in Acts 1 and 8, when a person gets saved, they have the power. Ye shall receive, after you receive the Holy Ghost, ye shall receive power. The child of God has that power. The strength from God to not practice sin. And the child of God does not practice sin. The unbeliever practices sin. So when you see your unsaved loved ones, they come to dinner, they come to you, you go to the family pickout, you go to them, you go visit them or whatever, and they're smoking and drinking and everything. Don't say, oh, that's disgusting. That's, oh, why don't you stop? You, 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 boy, you're going to hell. No, that's wrong. Because where they may be doing something sinful, you have to realize before you got saved, you ran around, you did committed sin of some sort yourself. No one need to tell you, stop drinking, stop smoking, stop fornicating, stop, stop, stop. No, you don't tell them to stop because they have not the power to stop. You tell them that Jesus Christ, Son of God, died on the cross for sin. He wants you to repent of your sin. Feel godly sorrow for your sin. Admit to him about your sin. You are lost and you need a deliverance. You need a savior. Stop selling drugs. Stop taking drugs. Stop sleeping. Stop being gay. Stop being doing this and wrong acts. It's not the gospel. It is not the gospel. So whether you're a conservative Christian, a government Christian, political Christian, whatever, we need to just tell people the simple gospel message that Jesus Christ, Son of God, the Messiah, came into the world to die for sin. He was buried and he rose again. Confess your sins before him. Admit your sins before him. Recognize your sins before him and turn away from it through the power of regeneration being saved. That's, that's what it is. See, this message here, it, 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 it cannot be for the, un, for the unsaved. But what Paul is saying to the Romans who feel as though they are proud people as Jewish Romans or, or Gentile Romans, is Paul says you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve and be under the domination control of sin unto death, or you or or you're going to be under the control and the dominancy of obedience unto righteousness. This is verse 16. Notice verse 17. But thanks be to God, but God be thanks that ye were, ye were slaves to sin, servant of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that what? See that? See what? Notice you have obeyed from the heart 
the gospel which was delivered unto you. The word, the gospel. You know, last night I caught a little bit. I, I looked at it before, but I caught a little bit of the of, of, um, uh, one of the cable networks, the movie. It was, the, I think it was the true life of um, Jesse James. I was looking at that. And uh, I looked at it for a while, and I was amazed how that the preacher on that movie recognized that he, when he baptized people, he really thought that they got saved. And he was thrilled about it. He was very thrilled about it. As some of you who think that because you stopped smoking, got baptized, you stopped running parties and got going here and there, and you got into church, your life changed, your, your language changed, you, you're a good person on job now, your mannerism and everything is more wholesome and clean even at home. You stop beating your wife, you stop cursing, you stop gambling. These things in itself morally, morally are good. But that's just like taking five steps or seven steps or whatever for a recovery alcoholic or recovery drug addict. You take it step one day at a time. The Bible knows nothing about this. That is not true salvation. You, you, you cannot put off in order to be saved. You put off because you are saved you are a believer, you are a saint. You die daily from, by the cleansing of the Holy Spirit because your body picks up defilement and it is corrupt. And you need daily cleansing. That's why Paul said, I die daily. That's called sanctification. Sanctification has nothing to do with justification. Justification, excuse me, justification is a one-time act wherein God declares you righteous and you are saved. But sanctification co continues until you die or until Jesus comes back. Because you are cleansed and set apart from Christ for Christ in three stages from sin, from the from indulging in sin, the power of sin and from the presence of sin when Christ comes back. Sanctification, set apart. That's why Paul says, but thanks be to God, you were slaves to sin. You were servant to sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of gospel, that, that, that word, that gospel, that delivered you. Being then, having been made free from sin, that phrase has nothing to do with, I don't sin anymore. No, it doesn't mean that. It's free from the power of sin. What have we been talking about? You have to go back to verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, control over you. You have the strength from God to say no, to walk away. You can't tell an unbeliever, just say no to cigarettes, just say no to drugs, just say no to sex, just say no to this, because they're going to come back. They have no will. They have no strong. Now, admittedly, I agree. I admit. Some people does have a human will to forsake a, a, a certain sin or practice in their life. I grant you that. But that is not salvation. Many they think it is, but it's not salvation. You may turn your life around and become morally a new person. Maybe something shocked you, something happened in your life, and something we call bless, bless happened to you, and you change your life around for the good. That is not salvation. And you can go on that life for many years even until death, and die in your sin. 
That's what it caused the sin unto death. But you're so deceived in thinking because I don't fornicate, lie, cheat, steal, gamble, and do harsh things and curse and, and whatever. And I change from that. You think that maybe God will let me into heaven. No, it don't work that way. Peter is not at the gate letting nobody in because there is no gate. Jesus said, I'm the door. I mean, he used that as a metaphor. Peter cannot save you. Mary cannot save you. The church cannot save you. The pope, the pastor, the bishop, no man, no one can save you. There's only one mediator, one savior between God and man. It's the man, Jesus Christ, who died for us and was buried and rose again the third day. I want to step back. I want to step back uh, to Romans 6. I started at verse 14. I really wanted to look at verse 6 up to 14. You see, the as a unsaved person, which a, a saint was, you was unsaved, you are a saint now. You're a child of God. You're a Christian. Same thing. But you see, before we got saved, and to the average person that is not saved listening to me, you have an old man. You have a nature. You're born. We're all born in sin. We all have that sinful nature, the desire to do evil, the desire to do bad. To do wrong. Okay. Our heart is deceitful. God knows my heart, He sure does. It's wicked. Okay. Whenever somebody tells you, oh, God knows my heart, you let them know you're right. Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. But what lies within us is an old man. That's an expression Paul used in verse 6 as the sin nature. It dominates us before we got saved. And if you're not saved, it's dominate you, dominating you in a soft manner, a mild manner, a high manner, and a highest of manner. But you're, you're, you're walking as a whole, dead men walking. What Paul says in verse 6, he says, knowing this, that your sinful nature, your old man, is put to death, is crucified. And the word crucified, I understand that it means to die is dead, but that's not the meaning here. Because if it was, then our old man, our nature, in thinking bad, acting bad, behaving bad, even in believers now, would not take place. But we do. But you see, the old man is under control of the power of Christ that is in your life now. You as a child of God can resist sin, say no, walk away, wherein the unsaved person whose dominant nature is sinful is the old man generated by sin, that nature, sinful nature, and it can't help but setting. But Paul says, know this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, destroyed, conquered. Now here the word destroyed is a different meaning. Because you are average, obviously the word destroyed means perish, gone, wiped away. But our sinful nature, our sinfulness is still in us. As believers in Christ, and therefore Paul told the Galatians, walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. How can you tell that you're walking in flesh? Paul gives the category there. And then Paul says, if you continue to walk in the flesh and it's dominating your life, you're being deceived and you're really not saved. So Paul says that in Romans, in Romans, to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the, he repeats himself because many people are under the delusion of being deceived that they can be gay, homosexual, solemn, commit the acts of Solomon, 
prostitution, drunkenness, way with li living a life of sin and still be a Christian. You cannot. Because your nature is dominated by sin. Now, you may have a speck of what? Moral decency. You may have a speck of moral innocence, niceness, goodness, and kindness, but that's not salvation. That doesn't mean that you're saved. I mean, you can imagine whether you're a senior or older person or a younger person, and you're mild, considerate, and nice to people, you get the shirt off your back. You give, you give, you give. You're humble and meek. That's not salvation. That don't mean that you have, have it tight with God. No, that means that you are human. You have resort to bring your flesh under some subjection. I stop drinking and smoking and whatever you may do. But that's not salvation. You can live a vigorous life of moral innocence, moral kindness, moral... De you notice I put the word moral in front of that. Because it's possible. It's possible for you as a well-off person to give to society, to give to the poor, to help the homeless. And, but that's not salvation. It is possible for you to be uh, well off to adopt children, to do this, to help programs, and what, but that's not salvation. It is possible for you to be tenderhearted and good of nature to help the community, to help those that, that, that is in need with food, clothing, housing, education, but that's not salvation. All those things has nothing to do with salvation. It is good under the category of self-righteousness, moral kindness, moral decency, and good. It's good that you help clean up the Chesapeake Bay here in Maryland, USA. It's good that you help clean up the water sewage and things like that. It's good that you vote. It's good that you do things for the government and your community and your society. But all that accumulation of goodness and kindness that you show to the homeless, the poor, the uneducated, to the well-being, to, 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 to Jewish people, to black people, to Chinese, the Korean, to help people do this and get food and food stamps and, and money and pay their home to help them with their mortgage and their life, that's not salvation. Many people are deceived by that. They, they really, really are deceived on it. And they think that they use the gesture, God bless you, you're blessed, I'm alive, I'm blessed. If they only knew that Satan through his demons is deceiving them, they go to church, they sing on the choir, they read their Bible, they study their Bible, they sit in a Bible class, they go to Bible school. They preach, they teach, they're deacons, they sing on the choir, they're trustees. But the majority of these people are still not saved. And they're good, hardworking, honest people, but that's still not salvation. They could be your relatives, your friends, your neighbors. They're still not saved. They need to repent. A person that is living in the three categories in Ephesians chapter 5 that Paul says fornication, uncleanness, and, and, and covetousness. If you're practicing those sins within those three categories, and there's more, Paul is says, and you're and saying that you are saved, Paul is saying you're deceiving yourself. And this is what he's 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 relating to those in Rome, the church in Rome, because within the church of Rome, you have unconverted people posing as Christians. In the churches today, you have people in church hooping and hollering, singing, praising, preaching, teaching, doing mission work, doing evangelist work. They are not saved, but they're doing their best. They're not, why, why am I judging? No, I'm not judging. I'm telling you, there's only one way 
that's only one way you can be saved. That's through Jesus Christ, and that's repentance of your repentance of your sins and faith in Jesus Christ. For you to say, "I'm saved," but I tarried, I spoke in tongues, I got baptized, I joined the church, I took the mass, I took the Lord's supper, I felt a burning in my bosom. I stopped smoking, I stopped drinking, I stopped gambling, I stopped wife beating, I stopped husband beating, I stopped lying around, fornication, adultery. I, 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 now and then, I, 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 as a man, I sleep with a man, but now and then I sleep with a, a, a woman as a woman. See, you're lying to you, you're deceiving yourself. And these Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians were the same, and Paul is saying, look, let, that's, that's what that praise means, let no man deceive you. Paul says, now, if ye be dead with Christ, we believe that ye shall live with him. Sin is not dominated. See, that's a metaphor. Paul is saying here that to be dead with Christ is, to have to repent, is that you have repented of your sins and trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. You will live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. As Christ rose from the dead victoriously, when you receive Christ as your Savior, hear me now, sin has no more dominion over you. It has no more control over your life. You are a new person in Christ. Being a new person in Christ means that you do stumble. It means that you do still make mistakes. It means that you do still fall on your face. But it do not mean, it does not mean that you continue, 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 continue practicing, practicing, practicing sin. That's a no-no, because that evidently means that you are not saved. So sin should not be reigning, controlling in your mortal body, verse 12. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Look at verse 13. Neither yield ye yourselves members as your members, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Then someone says, or thought the thought, Paul went on and wrote it, he says, what shall what then shall we send because we're not under the law but under grace god forbid perish that thought do not think that because you say you're saved and sin is dominating your life paul says no you're still under the law of sin and death you're committing the sin unto death. You will die in your sin. Be not deceived. And it's marvelously how Paul in this, 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 this chapter here winds it up by saying, let me, let me just read out uh, verse 21 to 23. And, and listen to what he says. What fruit had ye then to those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, from the dominancy of sin, the, the control of sin, and become slaves to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the punishment of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus. See how he closed that out? 
So as you continue to practice and let sin dominate your life, you're committing the sin unto that. And sooner or later, there's going to be wages, which the wages of sin is death, the second death, not physical death. You see, there's a first death, there's a second death. And they co-in. How do they co-equal, co-line up with each other? Because in both situations, you die. One, the first death, you die physically and you come back. The second death, you get judged and you die and you don't come back. You perish. You're gone. That's the death that Paul is saying. For the wages of sin is death. You will not have immortality. You will not have eternal life. You will not be in existing somewhere. You are gone, and you're never coming back. That's why, that that's what it says. That's what the death is. See, death is, people say, oh, I die, and I'm going somewhere. You That ain't dying. You're still existing. Death is death. You're dead. That's the first death. When you die, you're dead. You don't go nowhere. You're dead. Your body is dead. In the second death, you rise up in your fist from your physical death. Every human being will rise and face Jesus Christ, the God of the universe. Be judged for their sins. Their name is not written in the book of life. They are cast, they're sentenced. The word is sentenced into the lake of fire. Stop believing that the lake of fire is a big ocean of water, of watery fire. It, the, the, see, John even tells you what the lake of fire is. Whosoever name was not found written in the book of life was sentenced, cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's, that's I guess, that is plain, right? For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Either you're going to have eternal life with God, existing immortality with God. You cannot have immortality in existing somewhere because if you're still alive, then that means you have immortality. You have an everlasting life. And you can't exist somewhere because existing means you're still alive. Then that means death is not death. So Paul, let's go back to Ephesians 5 as we close here. So Paul is, is letting these Ephesian Christians know, or those who say they are Christians, he's not saying, you're not a Christian, you're not a Christian, you're not a Christian, or you're smoking, you're drinking. You're, you, you can't do that. And Paul is not doing that. He's just saying, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor unclean person can inherit the kingdom of God. See, he didn't that. He just brought it out. And those that practice within these these sins, don't be deceived. And in each letter that Paul's write, you're going to find tucked away somewhere in the Roman letter, Corinthian letter, Ephesian letter, Philippian letter, Colossian, you keep on going, that he's going to say, be not deceived. You were once. You used to practice or sin. You used to do these things. But fornicators and adulterers shall not even hurt. See, he, he says these things to Waking people up and realizing that you're in church, but you're not in church. Let me repeat that. You're in church, but you're not in church. Let me give you understanding. You may be in a building or fellowship with people, but you're not in the church of God, the Christ church. You're not saved. Participation in a building, in a fellowship, in a worship, in in a building or gathering, just because you do that doesn't mean that you are saved. And that's the average person on Sunday. They go to worship. They go to church. And they should so they can hear the gospel at least. But they're not hearing the gospel. I know that because look at all the stuff that's out there. Somebody somewhere is not hearing the gospel, the true gospel. They're hearing another gospel. And they're being deceived by it.
So as I conclude here in Ephesians 5 and 6, Paul says, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things comes the wrath of God. Upon the children of disobedience. Now I pause that because there's a scripture here in John. It's a fearful, fearful scripture here. In John 6, John 3. Oh yeah, John 3. Not 3.16, no, no, no. John 3.36. Let me read it. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 36. He that believes on the Son. See how that ties in with John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. These things are written, the, 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 the miracles and signs that Jesus did. These things were done that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have eternal. See here, he that believes, all that is right here in John. He that believes on the Son has everlasting the life. See, only those that believe in Christ live forever. You have ever, and everlasting life is immortality. It has nothing to do with the fountain of youth. It has nothing to do with pills and makeup and cutting up and surgery. God says when you believe on the Son, you have everlasting life. Life enduring. No ending life. You still exist with the Father. No one can exist forever and forever and still be alive outside of knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. But notice the second part of this verse. The second part says, he that believes not. So either you believe right now, because you or I could die. Job chapter 14 says, man that is born of a woman is full of days and full of trouble. You're going to die. And after death, it's the judgment. If you do not believe on the Son, here it is, you shall not see life. That's, that's immortality. That's everlasting life. So the balance is this. Either you believe on the Son, which means you have repented of your sins, admit to God that you are a sinner, that you are lost, and you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, become a child of God, you believe you have everlasting life. Or the other balance is you don't believe, you have not repented, you have not true faith in Jesus Christ. You trusting in works and gimmicks and feelings and tongues and slain in the spirit and, and whatever, but you didn't truly genuine believe. You're not going to see life. See, see life. Experience life. That's what the word see means. So how can you say that you're going to exist somewhere with life when if you don't believe in Christ, you can't. I mean, it's right there. You know what you're going to experience? The wrath of God. The judgment of God upon you, you will be judged for your sins at the end of time, which every human being, I don't know when, it could be 20 years from now, 5 years from now, 30, 100, 1,000 years from now, 
but every living being from Adam to the last person will rise and face Jesus Christ, Son of God, God in flesh, and be judged and receive their punishment for their sin if they have not believed they will experience the wrath and judgment of God. Wrath is punishment, condemnation, and judgment. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We know that there are many out there who are living a innocent, moral, morally good, extraordinary good life through some act of deeds, work. They are so beautiful in and out in a moral perspective. Whether they are rich, whether they are movie stars, whether they are professional careers and whatever, all need to repent because you have appointed a day in which all will be judged by that man whom you raised from the dead, Jesus Christ. May loved ones, family members, Friends, relatives are far off, neighbors, people in the community, people in the White House, those in the Senate, those in Congress, House of Representatives, those in government officials, whether it's federal, state, or local, whether those in the sports arena, career-minded, education, whatever it may be, in psychology and law or whatever. May they be moved, drawn by the Holy Spirit of God that he may prick their hearts, that they may cry out to God and repent of their sins and believe the gospel. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So we're going to uh, continue in Ephesians 5 here and uh, look like we're getting into the marriage part of Ephesians 5 and dealing with submitting. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 21 and closing in Ephesians 5. We'll try to close out that chapter next Lord's Day. May God bless all right, this evening, now this message will be on Facebook and YouTube soon uh, for you to re, uh, go over again. We ask the parents again to, uh, we did the church school for the children early 9 o'clock this morning. If you didn't get an opportunity to look at that, it's on Facebook now and also it's on uh, YouTube. You can turn to that. Go over the lesson with your children. Okay? This evening at 530 is our evening uh, service. We'll be dealing with the Gospel of Mark, trying to close it out, really, because the inner part of Mark deals with Christology, in which we're studying in Sunday school. Thank you, praise God. I think that was uh, one of his grandchildren. Huh? <laughs> All right. <laughs> we thank you, praise God. Be in prayer, Lord's willing. We come back again this evening and Wednesday night prayer Bible class, which involves pers perseverance of saints. We thank and praise God. God bless. All right. Again, if you have any questions, bring them back to Wednesday. And I, I, I think Sunday school, we had a lot of questions. So study your Bible, bring in a question, write them down. Just like me, I might forget, you might forget. So Wednesday, you can ask. Okay? All right. God bless everybody. Take care. All right.